We're looking at the kings of Israel after the split in the kingdom. The reason that I've titled the sermon Mangled is because that's really the picture of Israel that we've got at this point, and it's not going to get any better. The, uh, if you want to make reference here on your chart, you can look in the kingship started with Saul and um, went on from there to David, and David obviously is uh, the greatest king that Israel ever had, and then it was Solomon after that, David's son, and uh, that was really Israel's heyday, the golden age, where they enjoyed greater uh, prosperity and peace than at any other time, but it was after Solomon's death that the kingdom got split, and we will see that split remain until their captivity. The ten northern tribes uh, defected, if you will, and went in their own direction with their own king, and the uh, southern half of Judah uh, was kind of on their own, doing their own thing, establishing their own leadership. And so if you look at Israel as a country, I would liken it to a, a bodily limb that started as a terrible break, a mangling, like the uh, x-ray there on the photo. Uh, but it didn't end there. It grew worse, uh, becoming greatly infected and then eventually becoming amputated. And by that I mean both tribes, uh, or rather both halves of the country, are eventually going to be taken into captivity, one into Babylon and one into Assyria. Judah, the southern half, is going to go into Babylonian captivity 345 years after Solomon's reign ended and the kingdom was split. And you can see that on your charts also. Now, during that time, they're going to have 20 different kings, 11 of which are known for their evil. Now, you look at the northern part of Israel, they will go into a captivity of their own, only it will be Assyria that takes them captive. And instead of 345 years of independence, they will only enjoy 209. It will be a short 209 years before they go into captivity. That's 136 years before Judah does. And in that span of time, they're going to burn through 19 kings of their own. Judah will go through 20 kings before their captivity, 11 of which are evil. Israel will go through 19 kings in that time. And every single one of them is regarded as evil. You look at the fruit of this kingdom split. What the results were. You'd have to conclude that it's not God's intent that fractures like this and divisions would ever occur among his people. That has come through loud and clear on the pages of Scripture. God hates division. He goes so far as to say that He hates those who cause it. The Bible speaks so often of unity and togetherness and fellowship that to see something like this, you'd have to almost wonder if God was in it at all. And yet He is. Even in this mess, he's directing things according to his own sovereign will. Somehow out of this entire pile of national junk, he's going to birth a savior that's going to right everything that was wrong and establish order. It doesn't always happen according to our own timing, does it? Sometimes it doesn't even happen according to our own understanding, but it does. It will happen, whether we understand it, whether we like it, whether we have it when we want it or not, God is still at work, even in the mess. And so we, tonight we'll be looking at two kings in the realm of the southern part of Israel, that of Judah. The two kings that we'll be looking at this evening are by the name Abijam and Asa. 
Next week we'll be looking at the kings of Israel more closely, but tonight we focus on two kings in Judah. The first one, Abijam. He is the one who is taking over after Rehoboam's death. It says in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, and now that was the king in the northern half, in his 18th year, Abijam became king over the southern half. Now it's interesting here, Abijam, the name means my father is Yam. The pronunciation might be closer to Abayam. My father is Yam. Yam was a Canaanite sea god. Now, we'll be going into 2 Chronicles 13 in just a bit. You'll find that in that part of Scripture, he isn't named Abijah, uh, Abijam. He is named Abijah. That means Yahweh is my father. Apparently, he had both names with two extremely contrasted meanings. One, the Creator God is my father. And another, this false demon God, that's my dad. We get the idea already that this individual was a bit conflicted, a bit split, a bit unstable. Double-minded is how James might put it. Unstable in all he does. And certainly he's not going to leave a very good legacy, nor will anybody who's got a life full of divided worship. Never finding any footing in this life as far as their devotion to Christ is concerned. They vacillate back and forth between serving the Lord and going to church and then abandoning the fellowship and living in sin. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And lives like that might have bouts of decency, uh, periods of um, seemingly righteous behavior or at least a bit of piety mingled throughout. And yet there is so much sin there that you have to wonder what kind of legacy they're actually going to leave. Well, we can read about Abijam here. It says in verse 2 that he reigned for three years in Jerusalem. Three years, that's it. Doesn't sound like it has God's blessing on it already. In fact, in the Old Testament, when God would raise up a king, he always seems to bless that individual or at least make the promise of blessing if that individual would prove to remain faithful throughout their reign. And the promised blessing that would often be given would be one of longevity. I will lengthen your days. I will establish your throne. I will give it to your children and your children's children. Here you've got a bijum. My father is a Canaanite sea god whom God allows to reign over his people, but only for three years. See, God lets him partake of the things of God. He lets him play the game, be involved with God's people, and actually establish himself in a fairly prominent position, I might say, as king but not for too long. So God will let you in. He'll let anybody in. Even those who have no faith. Welcome. But for how long, we don't know. And for Abijam, he made it three years. But three years was all. It tells us that his mother's name was Mayaka the granddaughter of Ibishalam. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. It's interesting to me how Abijam decides to take after his father, Rehoboam, rather than his great-grandfather, David. 
How easily it is that the sins of a father can be transferred to the next generation. It ain't hard at all. Speaking as a father myself, I would say that it is all too easy. Much to my chagrin. I certainly don't want it to happen. I suppose there's a certain amount to which it's inevitable that my children will get a little bit of the best of me and unfortunately also a little bit of the worst. But just in passing, might I say, how easy it is for the sins of a father to transfer to his own children. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, it says, You shall not bow down to idols nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. It can sometimes take many generations for those sins that have plagued a family name to be worked out. Three or four generations, that's a long time. And I'll tell you, if, if any one of those three or four generations make no effort to eliminate the sin, they only prolong that process and increase the number of generations that that sin will remain. Now David, he's done righteously. Rehoboam, no. Abijam, no. But David did. And he's still even now being honored by God. Even in, his, even in the life of his grandson. And even beyond that. David is being honored posthumously by God because David had lived a life of righteousness. In Exodus chapter 20, I already read verse 5 about the iniquities being visited to the third and fourth generation, but in the next verse it says that God says, I will show mercy, though, to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Sin? It'll take you a good three or four generations to work that out. You want to eliminate sin from the family tree there? You better get to work, and you better pray good for your kids, and you better pray for your grandkids, and you better pray that by the time you get to your great-grandkids, that sin, whatever it is that you so struggled with, is actually gone. Blessing and honor, that'll take you a good thousand generations to work out of your family tree. In other words, God is far more eager to bless a family than he is to curse it. You have a far harder time getting rid of God's blessing than you do sin. Do you realize that? Now think of how hard it is for you to eliminate sin. You get that, don't you? Like you struggle with it and you're like, I can't get rid of sin. It seems like it's always there. Yeah, well, it's even more difficult. It's exponentially more difficult to get rid of God's blessing once he decides he's going to bless you. How secure is that? Very eager our God is. Sorry for Abijam, however. The only good that God did to him was on account of somebody else. It's a sorry testimony. I want to read to you verse 6, and then we're going to jump. It says, There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Yes, they are. So we'll turn there. 2 Chronicles 13. And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. So Abijam rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And then Asa, his son, reigned in his place. And we'll get to Asa in a moment. However, we need to look at 2 Chronicles 13 for two reasons. One, it'll give us a fuller picture of Abijam and what we can learn from his sorry life. Also, the second reason here, I'm never going to teach through 2 Chronicles. Just so you know. Never. Okay, <laughs> far be it from me, Lord, that I would ever teach. <laughs> like, the first nine chapters are names only. So you guys don't want me to teach this. Okay, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, we're just going to just erase that from the agenda. Uh, but I am going to dip into those books every once in a while as we go through First and Second Kings because we can um, gather additional information that will help us get a little bit better picture of the kings that we're studying. So Abijah. Now, you notice the name change. 
chapter 13. Now we're talking about Abijah, same guy, different name. And it's interesting that he's called Abijah here because in chapter 13, he's not painted in such a bad light as he was kind of in 1 Kings 15. At any rate, let's read for ourselves here, starting in verse 1, 2 Chronicles 13. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Abijah became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah. Uh, we read it, Maaka, I think, in the previous passage. The daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. That's nothing new. We already read that in 1 Kings. Verse 3, Abijah set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. Jeroboam also drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men, mighty men of valor. And then Abijah stood on Mount Zimmerim, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, Jeroboam, in all Israel. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of salt. Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. Then worthless rogues gathered to him and strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and inexperienced and couldn't withstand them. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hand of the sons of David? And you're a great multitude. And with you are the gold calves which Jeroboam made for you as gods. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and made for yourself priests like the peoples of other lands, so that whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may be a priest of things that are not gods? But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron. And the Levites attend to their duties. And they burn to the Lord every morning and every evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. They also set the showbread in order on the pure gold table and the lampstand of gold with its lamps to burn every evening. For we keep the commandment of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Now look, God himself is with us as our head and our priests with sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O oh, children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for she, you shall not prosper. This guy's cocky. That's what I'm getting. I don't know if I'm right or not, but he sounds like it. He's got 400,000 troops, and he's going to war against an army that's twice as big, and he's standing on one mountain, basically kind of doing this thing. You guys are doing it wrong. We're doing it right. Here's a list of all your sins. We're, we're, we're decent. We, God's with us, not with you. Na, 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 na. It's like, all right. Now, he might have something to it, I guess. I mean, everything that he's saying is, is true. But he's very confident. Now, you got to wonder, where's his confidence coming from, this guy? Because you remember what we read about him in 1 Kings 15. His heart was not loyal to God. Right? And yet here he is going, Hey, Jeroboam, we're going to win. You know why? Because we're loyal to God. We have actual priests who are related to Aaron, the Levites, not you. You hire anybody from any old pagan nation that comes with seven goats. We're doing it right. We got people who set out the showbread. We got people to light the lamps. We're doing everything we're supposed to do. God's on our side, not yours. Very confident man. But his confidence isn't coming from his personal faith in the Lord. Because remember, he didn't have any. This guy's confidence comes from just being on the right team. He associates himself with people and surrounds himself with people who do the right thing while he himself walks in the sins of his father. That ain't going to fly. Associating yourself with people who love Jesus doesn't make it so that you love Jesus. Surrounding yourself with people who are able to hear the Lord and follow Him and serve Him well doesn't mean that you're able to hear from the Lord and follow Him and serve Him well. 
Knowing people who are filled with His Holy Spirit, born-again believers, doesn't make you a Holy Spirit born-again believer. Some people, I think, think they'll be saved by proxy. Just by being on the right team. I think there's a lot of Christians out there who think they're going to be saved from eternal hell because they're Christian. And they're proud of themselves for it. You know why? Because there's a lot of valid religions out there, but I picked the right one. I pick Christianity. That makes me right. All those Muslims and Buddhists and I don't know what else is out there, that new agey stuff. I'm Christian. I'm fundamental. I'm Baptist. It's like, you, you don't get any points for picking the right team. Satan knows the right team, too. He knows it's Christianity all the way. He knows that. Nobody gets points for going to the right church, picking the right church. And, oh, we can get so proud of ourselves. Well, I go to Jesus Fellowship, and God knows we're the only ones that are doing it right. First of all, we're not. Second of all, it doesn't matter if we're doing it right or not. You'd better be doing it right. Right? Somebody should have told that to Abijah. <laughs> Yahweh's my dad. Is he? Really? You might be related to Abraham, but I, I can't say that, that Yahweh's really like a father to you. Moving on in verse 13. But Jeroboam caused an ambush. Now, Jeroboam is the king of Israel, just to keep things clear. He's the guy that Abijah is fighting against. He's got twice as many troops as Abijah does. And Jerobo Jeroboam caused an ambush to go around behind them so that they were in front of Judah and the ambush was behind them. And when Judah looked around, to their surprise, the battle line was at both front and rear. And they cried out to the Lord. And the priests sounded their trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. Then Abijah and his people struck them with a great slaughter, so 500,000 choice men of Israel fell slain. Thus the children of Israel were subdued at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed, because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages, Jeshana with its villages, and Ephron with its villages. So Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him and he died. But Abijah grew mighty, married 14 wives, and begot 22 sons and 16 daughters. And the rest of the acts of Abijah, his ways and his sayings are written in the annals of the prophet Ido. Chapter 14 says, So Abijah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And then Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days, the land was quiet, ten years. Uh, interesting, because you read chapter 13 here, it kind of seems like Abijah was a decent guy. And yet, we already know that he was not loyal to God, and he walked in the sins of his fathers all his days. But here, he wins a great battle. He's going against an opponent with twice as many troops as he's got, and, and he's got his facts right. God is with them. They haven't compromised the priesthood. They still have Aaron's descendants serving in the temple. They've still got the Levites doing their uh, priestly duties and all the rest. And so God, to defend his own reputation, <coughs> brings a victory to a very undeserving individual named Abijah. The fact of the matter is, as wrong as he is for assuming that he's right with God for being on the right team, he was on the right team. And there is a sort of all-encompassing benefit for those who partake of the things of God, who allow themselves to be part of his church. There, there is a blessing to be had in that, whether you're a Christian or not. I think that's why some attach themselves to the church even though they don't have a personal faith in Jesus. Even they don't, they don't have the Holy Spirit within them to guide them. They don't have a, a, a natural sort of God-given relationship established. There's no communion between them and the Lord. 
but because they're part of the greater team, if you will, well, if the team wins, they win. Just like Abijah experienced here. And it says here that 500,000 choice men of Israel fell slain. So the losing team there lost 500,000 out of 800,000 men that day. That's devastating. That's devastating for a nation. That's devastating for the whole house of Israel. The number of casualties that can result from disobedience to God is staggering. The damage done to so many people on account of the rebellion of one or two should be enough to promote fear in any one of us with regard to personal sin, knowing that it only takes the sins of one or two people to inflict such damage and devastation to hundreds of thousands of others should cause us to think twice about transgression, deliberate sin. Now we're going to move on to Asa. Abijah is through with his life. He's had his chance to make a name for himself in this world, and he did. Not a good one, but he did. We turn back to 1 Kings chapter 15. First Kings chapter 15, and we'll start in verse 9. In the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah. And he reigned forty-one years in Jerusalem. Now that ain't bad. That to me already, not knowing anything further, would suggest that God perhaps had blessed him. We'll find out whether it was God's blessing or not. His grandmother's name was Maacah, the, grand, uh, the granddaughter of Abishalom. Now we've heard her name before. That was Abijah's mother. So this then would be Asa's grandmother. Now in verse 11 it says that Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. And he banished the perverted persons from the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Perverted persons, the language being used there indicates uh, homosexuals and prostitutes. So he kicked them out of the country. That's pretty radical. Also, he removed Maacah, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron. Um, fertility god, uh, this would have been a very embarrassing image to behold. We'll leave it at that. He cut it down and burned it by the brook Kidron. This would have been the... Uh, the landfill, the, the uh, place of garbage. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. He also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. Now at this point, we can see that Asa's life um, was not a bad one. He was a decent king, a good king. His life was marked by great reform. He's clean in house in Israel, making changes that needed to be made quite a while back. And he's the first one to step up and actually do it. He's undoing a lot of the progress that his fathers had made. And when I use the term progress, I use that term um, opposite of what it should be used for. Uh, it's kind of like modern progressivism. Yeah, not much progress there. It's uh, not such a good thing in most cases. Uh, and so his fathers had made a lot of progress, so to speak, in the areas of idol worship and um, uh, demonology. And he's undoing some of that. Uh, additionally, he stood against his own family. He stood up, he took a stand against his own family. If you look at verse 12, when it says that he banished the perverted persons from the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And then he takes a stand against Mayaka, his grandmother. These are his own relatives, and sometimes that can be the hardest. 
And some of you in this room have already begun to experience how difficult it can be when you start to get pushback from your family for loving Jesus like you might. And if that hasn't happened yet, then let me say before it does, as just a bit of a warning, we need to stop blindly trusting our own family just because they're family. Assuming that they're on our side just because we're related. Sometimes they're wrong. Yes, even your beloved father, your grandmother, your parents, your siblings. And sometimes your righteousness is going to make them uncomfortable. Your love for Jesus Christ is going to make your parents, your relatives, a little bit unnerved. And that's when they're going to start to apply the pressure. And we as a young church, I speak to you as young people with hardly a family of your own, only a few of you being married, we as young people need to start being discerning. We need to remember that though we are sons and daughters, we're also adults now. Nobody here is under age. We're adults who serve God first. And we always need to remember that so that we can keep ourselves from drifting back into the comfortable immaturity of childhood where mom and dad tell me how to live. And I feel that pressure to please them even when it compromises God's pleasure. It's within a person's own family circle that their faithfulness to God is put to the test. Did you know that? It will oftentimes be within your own homes. You know what Jesus said. I came to bring division in that home. Some of you, just by virtue of you being Christian, you signed up to have some kind of a split felt between you and your own parents. And oh, we'll work to avoid that and we'll work to keep that fault line from cracking any further. You need to stop. He came to bring division. It's okay if that division happens. When we keep compromising in order to keep that from occurring, we're doing a, essentially what Abijah did. Let Mayaka, the queen mother, continue reigning from her throne. Asa comes along and goes, You know what, Grandma? You're pervert. You're twisted. You know what, Dad? Your idol's got to go. And there's some confrontation happening there. He's not going to tolerate it. Because apparently he's got a heart that has been changed by God and he loves the Lord and he doesn't want there to be compromise. Not in his own life, not in his family any longer. I mean, how many generations has it been and the sins of the fathers have been visited upon the third and fourth generation? Ace is finally like, I want to bring some blessing to this family name for once. And it's never going to happen unless I start cleaning some house. So grandma, sorry, dad, my apologies, but this has to happen. And good for Asa. He was loyal to the Lord. He did good. He did what was right all his days. And you know what? Not, that can't be said about many of the kings of either Israel or Judah. 20 bad ones in Israel, 11 bad ones in Judah. That's 33 33 out of 39 kings were bad. And even the good ones, some of them were only partially good. Like they started good and ended bad. Asa, good from beginning to end. Loved the Lord, wouldn't compromise. Now we need to flip forward again to Second Chronicles and we'll start in chapter 14. In verse 2, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the altars of the foreign gods in the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah and the kingdom was quiet under him. 
Now, in passing, you notice that here it says he removed the high places. In 1 Kings 15, it says that he didn't remove the high places. Apparently, there is a bit of reform happening in the high places, but not total reform. Uh, either that or he perhaps had removed some of them in the first couple decades of his reign, and 41 years is a long time. Maybe by the end, they had start to rebuild those. I don't know. It doesn't say. At any rate, verse 6 tells us that he built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest. And he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore he said to Judah, Let us build these cities and make walls around them, and towers, gates, and bars, while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. And Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah, who carried shields and spears, and from Benjamin 280,000 men, who carried shields and drew bows. All these were mighty men of valor. Then Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. That's like tanks. That's like um, B-52 bombers. I mean, these are, chariots are the top of the line as far as military craft goes back then. So, <laughs> you know, you, you got a few hundred thousand dudes and then you've got a million coming out against you and they've got chariots. Things aren't looking good. So Asa went out against him, and they set the troops in battle array in the valley of Z uh, Zephatha at Marisha. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they couldn't recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army. And they carried away very much spoil. And then they defeated all the cities around Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them. And they plundered all this, those cities, uh, for there was exceedingly much spoil in them. They also attacked the livestock enclosures and carried off sheep and camels in abundance and returned to Jerusalem. I mean, this, just so you guys know, I mean, I don't even know how to sort of illustrate this to help us understand what might be the equivalent in our own minds. Just understand that this was an insane victory. This was the uh, underdog victory of underdog victories, okay? They were no chance of winning. And then they come home having just whooped this army. This is incredible. And then they bring all of this plunder, all of this spoil. This was a great day. This was cause for uh, great rejoicing nationwide for the men of Judah and their army. Going on to chapter 15. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. And he said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For, for a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you, be strong, and don't let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Odin, the prophet, he took courage. No doubt he took courage. And he removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. And then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. For they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord God was with him. So you got a few people defecting, coming from Israel to Judah. They're like, God's with him, I'm with him. Good for them. You should go where God is. And if God leaves me and you find out that I'm a fraud, you should go to a, a church that has the spirit in it where God is doing something, okay? Don't be loyal to, to somebody just because uh, you, you think that they're supposed to be loyal. Go where God is. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month. 
in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. And I like that also, uh, that, that victory combined with the encouraging words of the prophet was enough to make Asa double down on getting rid of the idols in the land. I mean, if God gives you great victory and, and, and you're encouraged and you see God moving, don't let that be reason for us to just kind of rest on it. That should actually give us greater fervor to go even further than we've ever been with the Lord and to, to take greater sort of territory, if you will, and to uh, eliminate uh, further sin from our lives and, and to be more aggressive, not more passive. In verse 11, it says that they offered to the Lord at that time 700 bulls and 7,000 sheep from the spoil that they brought. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. Now, get this. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. What if you lived in a country like that? You do know that anyone who doesn't seek the Lord God will be put to death, but it'll be a far worse death than just physical execution. You know that. So then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpets and ram's horns. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul. And he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. Also, he removed Maaka, the mother of Asa the king, from being queen mother because she had made an abom uh, obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image, then crushed and burned it by the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all his days. He also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. And there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. Now, um, verse 18 there. I want to read that one more time. He also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated. Notice what they're made of. Silver and gold and utensils. Now turn back with me to 1 Kings 15 and start in verse 15. It's the same thing we just read in the Chronicles passage. He also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils, right? So he's, he's dedicating these valuables to the Lord. Now, you know that when you dedicate something, it's, you know what dedicate means? It's theirs now. Okay? Plain and simple, that's what that means. Now let's go on here, verse 16. Okay, keep that in mind. Now read with me. Now there was war between Asa and Baasha king of Israel all their days, and Baasha king of Israel came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa king of Judah. So then Asa took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, I've sent you a present, silver and gold. Come and break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he'll withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Aijan, Dan, Abel, Beth, Maacah, and all of Chinneroth with all the land of Naphtali. And it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and remained in Terza. Then King Asa made a proclamation all through Judah. None was exempted. And they took away the stones in the timber of Ramah. That was the city that King, Asa, uh, King Baasha was building against him. And with those materials, King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. The rest of all the acts of Asa, all his might, all that he did, all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Of course they are. We'll turn back there in a moment. But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. And we'll get to that in just a bit. So Asa rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. We'll stop there as far as 1 Kings 15 is concerned. 
But go back once again to Second Chronicles. Now, before I say much else, I want to touch on this idea of Asa having dedicated the silver and gold to the Lord only to take it back in a time of crisis. Apparently, this is a guy who gave to the Lord, but then never really stopped considering it to be his own anyway. Yeah, I'll give this to the Lord, but it's not really the Lord's. It's mine to take back when I please. A lot of people do that. You'll notice from time to time, and maybe the temptation is within your own heart to dedicate something to the Lord and to make an oath to God and to basically agree to something between you and the Lord. Money or time, your life even, only to take it back in the end. And you know why he took it back? Because he was afraid. I mean, in his generosity, he had just accumulated all of this stuff. God had given them a great victory over Ethiopia. They plunder all these cities. He's got silver and gold, you know, out the wazoo. And so he's, I'm going to dedicate this to the Lord. Puts it in the treasuries, puts it in the house. And then, Baasha is coming after him, and he's afraid. And so he goes and takes back the very things that he dedicated to God. Out of fear. That says to me that generosity can be scary. We know this. I think that some of us, we have hearts to give to the Lord. We want to give. We want to give. We want to give as much as we possibly can. But it's scary, isn't it? When you think of giving something to the Lord, when you think, I want to increase my tithe this year. Or I want to start giving to missions this year. Or I want to really invest this year. I want to, I want to become a, a greater uh, uh, a part of the church by, by, by taking upon myself these obligations this year. And every time you think about upping your commitment to the things of God and to his people, there's a little bit of nervousness about that. If there's not, you're probably not being very generous. Because generosity is scary. And the more you give, the scarier it gets. It's just the way it is. We see that in Asa. We also see it in our own hearts if we're paying attention. What's interesting, however, is that Asa didn't need that silver and gold, which is probably why he dedicated it. He didn't need it until after he had already given it. Dang! That's like deciding, well, I'm going to start giving to missions this year. 50 bucks a month. And then your auto insurance gets jacked by like 52 bucks a month. And you're like, <clears throat> Lord, I don't know. I was just kidding about missions. Or maybe I could just like, Lord, can I like backpedal a little bit on this? And me and Sarah have been through this many times. Because life fluctuates, doesn't it? Stuff changes. And you're kind of locked in at a certain amount or, or a certain you know, time obligations or, or, or whatever it is that you've committed to God. You've kind of decided that this is what my life for the Lord is going to be. I'm going to give Him this much in whatever category. And then life throws you for a loop. You didn't need that time back then, but now all of a sudden you got a huge time crunch. And guess who's the first to get compromised? Usually it's God. So often, oh, I don't have time, so, you know, I'm going to have to skip church. Won't be there, pastor. It's like, don't apologize to me. You don't need to tell me where you're going to be. It's between you and God. How much you give to him is between you and him. In terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of resources, in terms of commitment. <laughs> Listen, you're not worshiping me. You're not serving me. It's ultimately between you and God. And if it's that uncomfortable that you would feel like, oh, I should probably tell the pastor, then you might want to rethink what you're doing. Here's good old Asa. I want to dedicate this to you, Lord. Silver, gold, that's right. And then all of a sudden a time of crisis comes and his faith is being tested. God uses generosity in your life to build your faith, to build your trust in him. Okay, Lord, I'll do this. And God says, wonderful, I'm going to test you now. Be prepared for that. Now, I'm not saying there doesn't come a time when wisdom would have you reconsider. But I will tell you that we shouldn't be quick to assume that it's wise to reconsider. I mean, none of us have uh, an enemy army coming up against us, do we? 
I mean, was it wise for Asa to go back and take back what he had dedicated to the Lord in order to defend him and his people against, like, certain death? Was that wise? Apparently it wasn't. Look at verse 1 of chapter 16. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha king of Israel came up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might let none go out or come in to Asa king of Judah. Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and from the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between me and you, as there was between my father and your father. See, I've sent you silver and gold. Come break your treaty with Baasha king of Israel, so that he'll withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. They attacked Aijan, Dan, Abel, Maim, and all the stored cities of Naphtali. Now, it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the stones and timber of Ramah which Baasha had used for building and with them he built Geba and Mizpah. Now you wouldn't have thought that that was any big deal if we would have left it alone in 1 Kings 15. But apparently God didn't want us to leave it alone. And so he inspired a different author here to write for us 2 Chronicles and add a little bit of information beginning in verse 7, which says, And at that time Hanani the seer, which is kind of like a prophet, came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, Because you've relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. This wasn't wise at all. This was not an act of wisdom for Asa to reconsider what he had dedicated to the Lord. This was foolishness. So let's not be quick to think that our reconsideration of what we might have formerly dedicated or committed to God is actually a thing of wisdom. Oftentimes, it's going to be found in the category of foolishness. Verse 10 says that Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. Because of what? Because he told the truth. Now let's not forget that Asa was a good man. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He was loyal to the Lord all of his days. Let's not forget that even righteous people sometimes get angry at the truth. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Make no mistake about this, guys. God was not pleased with this treaty. He wasn't pleased with Asa's distrust. In fact, I believe that God had given Asa... A another opportunity to see his great blessing and power just like he had done during the Ethiopian conflict. Oh, Asa, why? He had, listen, Asa had already proven himself capable of trusting God. Going up against that army of one million with 300 chariots and God had already proven himself to be entirely trustworthy. So Asa has no excuse for distrusting God with this Baasha siege and running to the king of Syria for help. No excuse whatsoever. God had already proven himself to be trustworthy. That's, I think, why God is getting after him here because Asa knew better. God had already proven himself. How often does God have to prove himself? And, and how, how quickly do we forget after he does? And how, how much time had passed be between the Ethiopian victory and this episode, and Asa had already forgotten how trustworthy God was. He came so close to seeing God's power and receiving his blessing, but he missed it. And he missed it because of fear and distrust and because of a hasty, emotion-driven compromise. That's what that is. Some of us, we can relate to that on some level at least. Certainly none of us are kings of a country or anything like that. But what we see in Asa can be easily seen in ourselves from time to time. 
Lord, I want to do this for you. I, I want to make great sacrifice for you. I want to be generous. I want to, I want to give. I, I, want that, I want that blessing that lies behind that, that kind of generosity. And then God goes, okay, well, then give. And then we start to give, and then we get scared. We go, oh, Lord, did I give you too much? Whether it be time or money, that's sometimes not the issue. Sometimes it's our life. We're like, God, I want to give you my life. And then God's like, okay, you want to give me your life? Go tell somebody about Christ. And we're like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know if I can handle that. Lord, I want to give you my life. I'll do anything for you. And God's like, really? Okay, well, then do this. And we're like, oh, why did I say that? We all have a little bit of that in us, that, that Asa distrust. But let's not forget that Asa was a good king. The Bible says it, so we can believe it. Now I want to finish out our study tonight by talking a little bit about his foot disease. All right? <laughs> First Chron or Second Chronicles 16, in verse 11, it says, um, Note that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. So, Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in his own tomb, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and they laid him in the bed, which was filled with spices and various ingredients prepared in a mixture of ointments. They made a very great burning for him. They made a big deal is what that means. Big funeral. He was a good king. I think people appreciated him. But what's tragic about this is that his legacy, his, you know, 41 years as king. He had a good run. He enjoyed the blessing of God. He saw God's power. He had faith in the Lord. His heart was loyal to him. He did what was good and what was right. I mean, anybody in here, would you like to die with that kind of a testimony? That'd be awesome. I'd like for people to know that I was loyal to the Lord all my days. I'd like to have a long run at this. I'd like to do much good. I'd like to bring reform. I'd like to abolish sin. It would be awesome. I'd like to do what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord, and I'd like to be remembered for that. You know what's sad, though, is that the last two years of his life were lived in such a way that he distrusted the Lord and is kind of... I mean, that, that's his... That's his, his, his parting shot. He sought help elsewhere. I don't know what the disease in his feet was all about. Some people would suggest some sort of ailment that turned into gangrene and eventually killed him. It took a couple of years, apparently. But he didn't seek the Lord. He sought the physicians. Now, it isn't that going to a doctor is sin, it's that not seeking the Lord is. And so you have Asa going out on a bad note. And it's sad because it wasn't just this isolated incident, it was, you know, what we read about him before where he goes to the king of Syria for help. He, he keeps going to the professionals for help rather than to the Lord. He goes to the Syrians. Why? Because they're professionals when it, when it comes to war. They're known for it. They were brutal. If anybody can protect me, be them. So I'll give them all the silver and the gold I can find, and they'll save me. So like, no, the Lord will save you. I got this crazy disease. I don't know what to do. Things are getting worse. I need the best medical help I can find. And as king, he would have had access to the best. But he didn't seek the Lord. Because we don't need the help of professionals like we do the help of God. If there's anything that makes a professional professional, it would be the Lord. Then why, why, why wouldn't we seek the Lord himself? Asa was a good king. He ran a good race. But then he tripped at the finish line. Dang. I wish that wasn't a possibility because there's nothing in me that wants to... There's nothing in me...
There's nothing more in me that wants to finish this race well. You guys know what I mean. Like the Apostle Paul, I want to run to win. I don't want to run just to trip at the end. You know what happens when you trip and fall before you cross the line? You get past and other people finish before you do. You get up and you still finish, you know that. But you finish as a finisher, not as a winner. And what did Paul say? He said, run so that you can win. Many compete, not everybody wins. Asa was one who ran well, but at the end stumbled in such a noteworthy way that God recorded it. So this wasn't just like something to overlook. This was God going, you know what? Asa was a great man. He was loyal. He did what was right. But look at, look at how he went out. It's as if God is saying to us, you're running well. That's great. But you've got decades ahead of you. You don't want to invest everything you've got in these decades of service to me only to trip on your way out. Stumble into heaven like... Oh! <laughs> hey! Hey, Lord! I don't want to do that, not after having worked so hard all these years to live with Christian integrity and trust in the Lord and build, build that faith. And we've seen God do great things. Certainly we've never been attacked by an Ethiopian army, but we've had our own share of difficulties to overcome. And as a church, we've overcome them. Here we are. We've seen God do things of great power and blessing to various degrees. I think he's got more in store. I think we could see greater power on his behalf than we've ever seen if we will just push forward and, and grow in our faith and trust him. The Bible says very clearly here that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the face of the whole earth looking for people on behalf of whom he can show himself to be powerful. I'd be, sign me up. What does he require? Will you trust him? Will you do what he says and do it his way? Or will you trust in the world? Going to the Syrians for help when you're freaked out. Going to the world. Seeking the professionals rather than the Lord. Where's your trust? Do we trust the Lord? Do we trust men? Do we trust the Lord or do we trust ourselves? I think God writes this kind of stuff in the Bible as sort of a I mean, certainly he's not doing it to embarrass Asa. New Testament tells us that these things were written long ago for our benefit. This is for our learning. Asa was a good king, and maybe some of us in this room were good people, but listen, that's wonderful that we're righteous and, and, and doing good in this life. And, you know, some of us, you know, uh, we're well on our way to eliminating sin from our own family tree. We're doing well in those areas. But the Bible would have us remain diligent every day for the rest of our lives. Why? Because I don't think God wants us to trip at the finish line. And then, I need to say this because I don't know, I can't look inside of your own mind, I can't look into your life, and so I need to say this. Um, maybe we're living the life of Abijam. We're not Asa at all. We're not a good king. We're a bad one. We're walking in the sins of our fathers. We're making no effort to trust the Lord, to abolish sin from our own jurisdiction. I don't know. May the Lord do his work in us, whatever that is. As I said before, it, it, Israel is quite a mess, um, but God is sovereign over that mess, still working out his, his own plan and purpose. Abijah gets no credit for it. He was very uncooperative. And so he goes down in history as a bad king. Read it. Evil. And then there's Asa. 
your average man, faithful to the Lord, a few problems along the way. I guess that's expected. God can forgive that. But it needn't be. Not when we have examples to learn from. Let's put our faith in the Lord. Trust Him always. And you know what else? We have each other too. So if you're scared, you know, if you're having a hard time trusting God on something, um, it's okay to pray. And it's okay to talk. And it's okay to ask for help. Okay? We're in this together. And I want to see you guys finish well. I want to see you guys at the end of the race come flying through that tape. I'd like to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant, not just for me, but it'd be cool to hear it. You know, if I get to eavesdrop, eavesdrop on like the good judgment, you know, like if somebody's done well, I want to hear that. I don't necessarily want to hear the depart from me stuff, you know. But hey, if I'm there and I get to hear some well done, good and faithful servant on your behalf, be okay with that. It's my prayer. Let's finish well. God, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. I don't know that we've ever gone through four and a half chapters before, but this was quite a trek. Lots to learn from these kings. Um, I thank you that uh, that you have given them to us as examples sometimes of what to do and sometimes of what not to do, but I suppose the same could be said of us. We can live lives that are exemplary and um, holy, godly, ones that are worth imitating, or we can live lives that are full of shame and regret and sorrow. Lives that lack integrity. Lives that are not worth emulating in the very least. And then I suppose we can live lives of in-between. A little bit of righteousness, but not too much. Just enough sin, but not so much that we get in big trouble for it. And I don't know which one is worse, Lord. We know how you feel about lukewarm. Please keep us from that. May we be filled with passion and zeal like Asa was after he saw your power displayed. May we bring about reform in our own circle, our own areas of life, and may we um, be a link in the ongoing chain that is our family tree that brings about a sort of sanctification that you might bless us to the thousandth generation and that we might end all of that sin that's been going on in years past. We pray that we would take a stand for what's right, even if it be in our own homes, against our own family. And we pray, Lord, that you would show us the way and empower us to walk on that path. It's in your Son's name.